Comprehensive Zero Trust. I've created this airport analogy around zero trust. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to a website most likely, and you're going to book a flight. When you book a flight, you're going to have to enter some identification, credit card information, maybe some passport details. And so that's the very first start of zero trust. Until you have the ticket, you can't move forward. Now that I have the ticket and it's the day of travel, I head over to the airport. Now, at the airport, there's going to be multiple policy decision points. The opportunity for the airport authorities to validate you as an individual that should be on that plane or in the airport. And there's multiple enforcement points, meaning that as they make a decision whether or not you pass a control point, they have the ability to enforce. That enforcement might come in the way of asking you to leave the premises because you don't have a valid ticket. It might also involve the authorities. The first thing you're going to do is check in and maybe you have to check your bags. This is the first opportunity for the airport to validate who you are. And they're going to ask you for maybe some identification, maybe your passport, the ticket itself, before they check your bag in. Once they check your bag in, it's going to be assigned to you. So if the disposition of that bag changes, your access to the airport may also change. Now, once that's done, you move on, but they are going to scan your bag. And this is that first check. Even though it's not you, it's the items you carry in. So it's your profile, your posture, and whether or not you might be met with authorities later on. Now, once you're done that, you're moving through security. Now, as you go through security, they're looking at your items. They're going to scan them. They're checking your ticket. They even may scan your person. They're doing all of this to validate that there's nothing changed in regards to your trust profile when it comes to flying. And so they're doing their due diligence here, making sure that there's nothing nefarious that might take place. Now, if this doesn't pan out well, or there might be things in there to ask for secondary screening, maybe nothing wrong, but they want to do some other validation. Then you move on and they may open the bag that you've carried on. They might inspect it. They're looking for things that might be nefarious, but they're also looking for things that may have triggered the initial alarm that is a false positive. Now, once you get past this, and let's assume you're in Canada and you're going through the U.S., you're going to go through U.S. Customs. Now, again, the ticket's checked. The person's checked. They're doing background checks, potentially. They're looking at the details of the trip. They're asking you information about the hotel and where you're staying and how long. They're scrutinizing here. Now, you can see there's multiple policy decision points up to this point and the opportunity to enforce or control the individual for moving further along in the process. Now, we're at U.S. Customs Secondary, potentially for some reason. And again, it could be nothing other than they want to do a secondary screening, checking that posture. They're making sure that you are who you say you are and you're safe to come into the country. Now, finally, you're past all of these initial checks and you're inside the security zone, but you're not trusted forever. There's cameras everywhere. There's agents walking the floor. And now it's time to board your plane. And when you board the plane, guess what? It's another opportunity to validate who you are and they're going to check your ticket and they're going to match that with the identification that you have. Now, if you get past that, fantastic, you're moving on. Seems like a lot of work, but it's fairly transparent for the most part. We're used to it. We know these checks and balances are in place. You may even get on the plane and they may call your name. See this time and time again. Who is X, Y, or Z? Can you raise your hand or push the button? They come back and they do another validation. Are you the right person? Do you have the ticket? Are you in the right seat, etc.? So that's my zero trust analogy. Now, when it comes to Cisco, we also have multiple policy decision points, the opportunity to control if we need to add any enforcement at any point in time. So at the top, we've got policy decision points and we have identity services engine, so network admission control on steroids. And this is going to use policy to make decisions, the posture of the device, the versions, 
the individual that's tied to the asset, the identity store that it's reaching out to, potentially the location. It's making a decision on whether or not you're going to pass and get connected to the network. And that network's going to be wired or wireless or VPN. And that's a single policy decision point that's enforcing at each one of those areas, wired, wireless, and VPN. And so now I have an opportunity to authenticate the individual, authenticate their device, and give them access to the network. And so now we're looking at zero trust access. It could be agent or agentless. It's least privilege. Again, you got network access or network admission control. You can now start driving towards micro segmentation and putting in those additional controls within the environment dynamically. You can posture and profile, you got user and machine authentication, and then multi-factor support as well. With VPN, again, the same thing. It shouldn't change because you're connecting differently. You're going to use the same policy decision point to validate zero trust, to make sure that you're providing least privilege. You're providing that network admission or network access control, posture, profiling, user machine auth, and MFA support. Now, as you start moving in towards the application and accessing the application, we start looking at secure access. And we've got two flavors here. One is VPN as a service, so you can shift and lift this to the cloud and have it a pure SaaS service. And there's accessing of private applications. There's additional controls here around surfing the internet, et cetera. But in regards to accessing the environment, Again, zero trust access, least privileged, network admission or access control, posture profiling, user machine auth, multi-factor authentication. That's to get access to legacy-based applications that may not suit private applications using a zero trust network access functionality. And as we transition to private applications, it should be agnostic to the application. All ports and all protocols should be supported. It should be agent and agentless. It should be least privileged access. It should hide apps from the public internet, provide posture, profiling, user and machine authentication, adaptive context aware so it can change if something changes in the disposition. You want user and device behavior monitoring and multi-factor authentication. Now, finally, the apps ride on systems or workloads. And so now there's an opportunity to also add layers of protection, regardless of the server that's running the application or service. It could be Kubernetes, it could be physical, virtual, it could be on-premise, bare metal, it could be in the cloud like AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google. And again, we're driving towards zero trust. It should be agent and agentless options available, least privilege. Now you're driving towards micro segmentation want some insight into vulnerabilities and applications, dependencies, and how they communicate and build policy. And then you're going to policy enforce with identity where it makes sense as well. So where can you do that? Well, Identity Services Engine, if you have it in place, is going to be able to feed additional insight into the access that you may be asking or requiring. And so for secure access, as an example, if you're doing VPN as a service, we can leverage ICE like we do on the wired wireless and VPN side to authenticate using identity providers like Azure, Active Directory, and many others. Also, secure workload can take in those identifiers and use them to build user base controls within the workload themselves. So instead of having something that's layer three, four, and even seven based controls, we can add identity for those user-based access to those services as well, providing a comprehensive zero trust outcome. And then you've got the collection of capabilities that feed into this. This could be Cisco or otherwise, but zero trust isn't about each one of these policy decision points and enforcement mechanisms. You're still leveraging things like IPS to make sure you scrutinize the packets because you don't trust those either. Even though they got authenticated and authorized and they're on the network, you're probably still running them through IPS and doing an inspection and doing TLS decrypt or uh, in our case at Cisco using encrypted visibility engine, uh, not having to do full decryption to determine if something is bad, but many options are available to you. The one thing that's critically important here is maintaining zero trust throughout the entire life of the session. And the one thing that Cisco's done is built in Cisco identity intelligence. 
which also includes identity threat detection and response. And so that is part of secure access. You get that when you, when you leverage Cisco secure access. You also get it if you leverage Cisco extended detection and response. And you also get it with Cisco Duo. So there's multiple ways of leveraging this, but it's not unique to Cisco. It, it ties into other identity providers. As an example, Azure. So it ties into these different identity providers. So you get a holistic view of identity across the board. And when we start looking at extended detection response, we start thinking about network detection and response and how that ties in with identity threat detection response and as well endpoint detection response. And this could be Cisco or third party. It should be agnostic, the, the, the platform that drives the extended capability. And then extended detection response ties everything together. You bring in that network telemetry. You bring in that email detection and response capability. You bring in the identity so you understand the identities. You've got the context of the device. You've got the understanding of how they connect. And then you augment that with things like email. So now if it came in through email, it was an attachment, it was executed, it started to navigate the local machine, escalated privilege, and then started moving laterally within the network, you're gonna be able to capture all of that detail and look at it through an attack chain view, giving you the best possible perspective of the attack that might be going on. And that's a little bit of comprehensive zero trust. The goal here is to simplify the outcomes, leveraging Cisco security, but also respecting other investments that you have that makes the overall solution better.